Welcome back. Let's start with this example. We have the function x cubed minus 9x squared plus 7x, and we want to determine the intervals where the given function is concave up or concave down. And the way we determine this is by finding the second derivative of our function and setting it equal to zero to find our potential inflection points, and then testing values on the intervals between those potential points to see whether our second derivative is positive or negative. And so let's start by taking the first derivative of our function and then taking the derivative again to find our second derivative. So f prime of x, or the first derivative, is going to be equal to 3x squared minus 18x plus 7. Right, if we take the derivative of each one of these terms using the power rule, this is what we will get. We multiplied by 3, subtracted 1 from our exponent to get 3x squared, multiplied 9 by 2, and then subtracted 1 from this exponent to get 1 and then we just have seven from seven x. And then we'll take the second derivative, so we'll have f double prime of x, and that's gonna be equal to six x minus 18, and the derivative of seven is zero, so I'm not gonna write that there, but the derivative of negative 18 x is negative 18, and the derivative of three x squared is six x. And so now we have our second derivative that we can now set equal to zero and solve for values of x, that have the potential to be inflection points or the points on our function where the concavity is changing. So if we set this equal to zero, we'll have zero equals six x minus 18. And if we add 18 to both sides, we'll have 18 equals six x. And then if we divide both sides by six, we'll find that x is equal to three. And so this is going to be our potential inflection point for this function. And so if we draw a number line here, and we label that point we found of three, then we're gonna have two intervals from negative infinity all the way up to three, and then all the values from three to infinity. And so we have those two intervals where we can test to see if our function is concave up or concave down. And so our two intervals are negative infinity to three, and then from three to infinity. And so now we're going to test values between these endpoints of our intervals on the second derivative to see if the second derivative at those points is positive or negative, and then that's going to help us determine whether our function is concave up or concave down on those intervals. And so let's pick a value between negative infinity and three. I'm gonna pick zero, so I have f double prime of zero, and that's gonna be equal to zero into our second derivative, so zero times six is zero, and then minus 18 will be negative 18. So I have negative 18, and that is a negative value, and so that means that our function is concave downward. And then let's pick a value between three and infinity. I'm gonna pick four, so I have f double prime of four, and that will be equal to plugging four into our second derivative, so four times six is 24, and then 24 minus 18 will be six. So we'll have positive six, which is, as I just said, a positive value, which means that our function is concave upward on that interval. And so what we find is that from negative infinity to three, our function is concave downward, and then it switches to concave upward from three to positive infinity, right? That's what we found for that interval. And as a result of that, that means at x equals three, we have an inflection point for this function because the concavity of the function changes at that point. So if you were to plug this value of three into your function, you would then have the coordinate point three, negative 33, and then this would be your inflection point for this function. So if you wanna check me on that value, feel free to plug in the value of three into that function for yourself and see if you can find the same inflection point that I just found. But to answer our main question here, we found the intervals where our function is concave up and concave down. Let's look at another example. Next we have the function f of x equals 3 fourths times x to the fourth power minus 2x squared. And once again, we're going to find the intervals where the given function is concave up or concave down. And so let's start by finding our second derivative. And so the first derivative, which we have to find first, is gonna be equal to four times three fourths. And so that's gonna be three times four divided by four. And then we're gonna have x to the third power if we subtract one from our exponent. And then for our second term, we'll have minus four x, right? Two times two is four, and then subtract one from the exponent to then just have one as our exponent. And so then to simplify that a little bit, we will have that these two fours will cancel and so we're actually just gonna have three x cubed minus four x. And so then we can take the derivative of that to find our second derivative. And so we'll have f double prime of x, and that's gonna be equal to nine x squared minus four. 
and that's just using the power rule on each of our terms in our first derivative. And so now we can set the second derivative equal to zero to try and find our potential inflection points. So if we do that, we'll have zero equals nine x squared minus four, and if I add four to both sides, we'll have four equals nine x squared, and if we divide both sides by nine, we'll have four ninths equals x squared, and then if we take the square root of both sides, we'll have the square root of four, which is two, and the square root of nine, which is three, and so we'll have that x is equal to plus or minus two thirds. And so now if we draw a number line for this scenario, we have two values of x that we're going to want to label on it. So I'll draw two lines here and we'll have negative two thirds and positive two thirds. And so now we have three intervals that we're gonna to wanna to test the concavity for on this function. We're gonna have all the values from negative infinity to negative two thirds, all the values from negative two thirds to positive two thirds, and then all the values from positive two thirds to positive infinity. So our three intervals are negative infinity to negative two thirds, negative two thirds to positive two thirds, and then from positive two thirds to positive infinity. And so now we're gonna pick values between the endpoints of our intervals and test them on our second derivative to see if they are positive or negative. And so for our first interval, I'm gonna pick negative one. That's gonna be between our endpoints. So we'll have f double prime of negative one, and that's gonna be equal to plugging negative one into the second derivative. So we'll have nine times negative one squared. Negative one squared is gonna be positive one. So one times nine is nine, minus four will be five. And that is a positive value for our second derivative, which means that our function is going to be concave up. Then for our second interval, I'm gonna pick zero. Zero is gonna be between those two values. So I have f double prime of zero, and that will be equal to nine times zero because zero squared is zero. So we're just gonna have zero minus four. So our value is negative four. And that is a negative value for our second derivative. So that means that our function is concave down on that interval. And then finally, we have our last interval from two thirds to infinity. I'm gonna pick one in this case. So we're gonna have f double prime of one, and that's gonna be equal to one times nine or one squared, which is one times nine minus four. So we're gonna have nine minus four, which is positive five, which again is a positive value for our second derivative, which means that our function is concave up on that interval. And so here we have the three intervals along with their concavity for this function. Now, notice that at negative two thirds and two thirds, the concavity is changing, right? For our first interval, we found it was concave up or positive. Then for the second one, it was concave down or negative. And then for the third one, it was concave up or positive. So the concavity was changing around these values of x, which means that they are both inflection points. And so if you were to plug positive two thirds and negative two thirds into this function, you would find that your two points of inflection would be two thirds comma negative 20 27ths and negative 2 thirds common negative 20 27ths. So those would be your two inflection points for this function in case you were interested in knowing that. Next we want to determine the intervals where the given function is concave up or concave down for this function g of x equals the square root of x. And so let's just start by taking the derivative of our function here. And so I'll start by rewriting that g of x is equal to x to the one half power, right? We like to rewrite the square root of x to be the one half power, because that's gonna make it easier for us to see how to take our derivative using the power rule. So then g prime of x is going to be equal to one half times x to the negative one half power, right? If we subtract one from one half, we get negative one half. Then we can take the derivative of that again. So we'll have g double prime of x, that's gonna be our second derivative, which is equal to negative one fourth, right, that would be negative one half times one half, and then we'll have x to the negative three halves power. If you subtract one from negative one half, you will get negative three halves. And then if we simplify, we'll have that this is equal to negative one divided by four times x to the three halves power. We just moved our variable with a negative exponent to the denominator so that that exponent is positive. Now, if we set this second derivative equal to zero, you're gonna notice really quickly that we're not gonna be able to solve for any values of x that make this function equal zero, right? Because your next step would be to multiply both sides by this denominator, and that would completely eliminate your variable because you'd be multiplying it by zero, and so it would just be zero. And so there's gonna be no solutions to this equation. And so what we find here is that there's no potential points of inflection for this function. But what do we know about the square root of x? Well, if we were to look at the graph of this function, it would look a little bit like this, right? You start at x equals zero, 
and then you continue on forever. Right, the square root of x is not defined for any negative values of x. It starts at x equals zero, and continues in the positive direction. And then that is the entire function. It's never going to change its shape other than this curve that is going to go on forever. And so what we have here is the domain from zero to infinity. And so we actually have just one interval that we can test here in this case from zero to positive infinity. And so we can do that. We can write down our interval here from zero to positive infinity, and we can test the value between those two points. So I could pick positive one, we'll have f double prime of one, and that would be equal to plugging one into the second derivative. And one to the three halves power is just gonna be one. And so four times one is four. And so negative one divided by four is negative one fourth. And so that's a negative value, which means that we're going to be concave down for this only interval of this function. And so you could certainly do this, but you could also just look at this graph and see that it is going to be concave down because the slope of the function is constantly decreasing. It starts out pretty steep and then it starts to level out as the function continues on. And so in this case for the square root of x, we just have one interval and for that interval, our function is going to be concave down. And so this is the answer to this problem. Next, we want to determine the intervals where our function is concave up and concave down for f of x equals cosine x from zero to two pi. So we're only interested in a certain section of this function. So we'll start by finding the second derivative by first finding the first derivative. So we're gonna have f prime of x is equal to the derivative of cosine x, which we know is negative sine x. And then we can take the second derivative. So f double prime of x is gonna be equal to negative cosine x because the derivative of sine x is cosine. And so you're just gonna have negative one times cosine. And so if we set our second derivative equal to zero, we will have zero equals negative cosine x. And if we divide both sides by negative one, we'll have that zero equals cosine x. So now the question is what values of x make the cosine function equal to zero on this interval from zero to two pi? And so for this interval from zero to two pi, cosine x is equal to zero when x is equal to pi over two and three pi over two. And so if we draw a number line for this scenario, it's gonna be a little bit different because we have a closed interval that we're looking at for this function. So we're gonna go from zero to two pi, and we're gonna have two values of x or two potential inflection points to label. So we're gonna have pi over two and three pi over two. And so now we have three intervals to test to see where our function is either concave up or concave down. And so we'll write them down. We'll have zero to pi over two. Then we're gonna have pi over two to three pi over two. And then we're gonna have three pi over two to two pi, right? We got that from looking at these sections between these points on our number line. So now let's test the value between zero and pi over two. I'm gonna pick pi over four because I know that's smaller than pi over two. So I have f double prime of pi over four and we're gonna be plugging that into our second derivative, which is negative cosine x. And so I know that cosine x of pi over four is equal to the square root of two over two, but you have to remember to take this negative into account. So we're gonna have this is equal to negative square root of two divided by two. And if you're plugging this into a calculator that gives you a decimal, it's going to give you 0 0.707 for this value, assuming that you have it in radians. And so this is a negative value for our second derivative. So we know that our function is going to be concave down for that interval. And so then if we test the value for this interval, we're gonna to have to pick a value between pi over two and three pi over two. And I'm gonna pick pi in this case, so I'll do f double prime of pi. And I picked that because I know that pi over two is less than pi and three pi over two is greater than pi. So I know pi is going to lie in this interval. And if we plug pi into our second derivative, we will have negative cosine of pi and cosine of pi is negative one. But remember that our second derivative is negative cosine, so it's going to be positive one. So then our function is going to be concave up on that interval. And then finally, let's test the value between three pi over two and two pi. And in this case, I'm gonna pick seven pi over four. So I'll have the second derivative evaluated at seven pi divided by four. And I picked this because I know that three pi over two is pi over two less than two pi, right? If I were to add pi over two to three pi over two, I would get two pi. And so this value is pi over four less than two pi. So it's going to be greater than three pi over two. And so then this would be equal to plugging seven pi over four into negative cosine x. 
and cosine of 7 pi over 4 is also the square root of 2 over 2. And of course, we have to take that negative into account. And so once again, it's going to be negative square root of 2 over 2 or negative 0 0.707 if you're using a calculator that gives you decimals. And so in this case, our second derivative is negative again, which means the slope is decreasing, which means that our function is concave down on that interval. And so now we found that for our interval from 0 to pi over 2, our function was concave downward, and then from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, it was upward, and then from 3 pi over 2 to pi over 2, it's downward again. And so then at each one of these x values, our concavity is changing, and so that means that x equals pi over 2 and x equals 3 pi over 2 are both going to be inflection points for this function cosine x. And so if you were to plug each of these values into cosine and get those full points, your inflection points would be pi over 2 comma 0 and 3 pi over 2 comma 0. So those would be your two inflection points for this function. But in this case, we're just looking for the intervals of concavity, and so this would be our final answer in this case. Let's look at one more example. So for our final example, we have h of x is equal to 4 divided by x, and we want to find the intervals of concavity for this function. And so let's start by finding the second derivative. But before I differentiate this function, I'm just going to redefine it. We're going to have h of x is equal to 4 times x to the negative first power. I just moved this variable to the top and gave it a negative exponent. So that's going to be easier for us to take our derivative using the power rule. So then h prime of x, or the first derivative, will be equal to negative 1 times 4, so it would be negative 4 times x to the negative second power if we subtract 1 from our exponent. And then we can move right into the second derivative. So we'll have h double prime of x is going to be equal to negative 4 times negative 2. So that's going to be positive 8 times x to the negative third power if we subtract 1 again from our exponent. And then we can rewrite this to be 8 divided by x to the third power because we just moved our variable with a negative exponent to the denominator to make that exponent positive. And so then if we set this second derivative equal to 0, you're going to notice that we're not going to be able to solve for our values of x. This equation is not going to have any solutions. There's no value that you can cube that when you divide 8 by it is going to give you 0. And so in this case, there's no solutions here. And so there's no potential inflection points. But there's one other thing that we need to keep in mind. And that is that a function can also change concavity at points of discontinuity or where the function is not continuous. And so if you look at our function here, we have a rational function where x is in the denominator, and so we're going to have a value where our function is not defined or where it's not continuous. If we set the denominator equal to 0, we'll have x equals 0. x equals 0 is going to be our point where our function is not continuous, and so that's going to be the value that we are going to use to create our intervals that we're going to use to test for concavity. And I didn't bother checking this in the previous examples because all of those examples were continuous functions, right? Cosine is a continuous function. The square root of x is continuous on the domain that it is defined. And the other two functions were polynomials, which are continuous everywhere. And so in this case, we just had one point of discontinuity. And so let's use this to see where our function is concave up and concave down. So I'll draw our number line like we usually do, and then we'll put our one point of x equals 0 on it, and we will test the intervals from negative infinity up to 0, and then from 0 to positive infinity. So we'll have negative infinity to 0, and then 0 to positive infinity. And so let's test values on our second derivative and see if it is positive or negative. So I'll start by picking a value between negative infinity and 0, and so I'll pick negative 1, that's going to lie on that interval. So we'll have f double prime of negative 1, and if we plug negative 1 into our second derivative, we'll have negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1, and then 8 divided by negative 1, which is going to be equal to negative 8. And that is a negative value for our second derivative, so we know that our function is going to be concave down on that interval. And if we pick a value between 0 and positive infinity, I'll pick positive 1, so we'll have f double prime of 1, and that's going to be equal to 8 divided by 1 cubed. And 1 cubed is 1, so 8 divided by 1 is positive 8, which is a positive value for our second derivative, which means our function is concave up on that interval. And so in this case, these are the two intervals that describe the concavity of our function. And now in this case, there's actually no inflection points because we didn't find any potential values of inflection points from our second derivative, right? This value of x equals 0 is just a point of discontinuity. It's just where our function is not continuous. It's not an actual point on the function. Our function is not defined at x equals 0, so there are no inflection points in this case. 
And so that's all the examples I had for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.